Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is Chucky Baby, who may be the oldest active AP. Chucky Baby, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Nice to be here. Um, how did you get started, and when was this? Well, wait, before <laughs> – you just said he may be the oldest uh, living AP, active AP. You, I think we, he has to tell us how old he is first. <laughs> how old are you, Chucky, baby? <laughs> okay, I I had my 90th birthday in December. Happy birthday. Nerd. Nine decades. <laughs> ah, let me guess. You're going to have your 91st this September. This time. <laughs> I'm pretty good at figuring those things out. All right. So, how long you been playing, and when did you get? St- and when? And how did this happen? Right. Uh, my background is uh, I was a chemical engineer, doing mainstream job with a aircraft company, and uh, it didn't suit me in many ways. So uh, I started traveling. I was in I was in England when I came across. Uh, uh, the gambling world, if you like, uh, I was actually, uh, in advertising. And, uh, I was, uh, an advertising copywriter, believe it or not. And there were two guys, uh, working in the company, uh, who were running a betting syndicate on horses. And I wanted to set up an advertising agency over there. And the, what they asked me to do was to join them in the betting syndicate and we would do the gambling as well as the uh, advertising. Uh, so this is really how I got, I, I knew nothing. I had the faintest idea about gambling until the age of 30. I was about 30 when that happened. And, uh, it was, uh, it was way back when, uh, in England, they do have what they call a tote, uh, which is, uh, like, you know, the parimutuel, but it's very, very small pools over here. So these, these pools are not worth playing, but they, most of the betting goes, even in those days, went on, uh, bookmakers odds. The bookmakers would lay odds, and uh, they had, at the time, it was a it was a very easy thing to beat. What they did was they 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 made a book on the win probabilities, but they didn't make a book on the place probabilities. Uh, I don't know why they didn't, but they didn't. Uh, when I say place, I mean first, second, or third. So we were picking races of two-year-olds, three-year-olds, uh, mostly two-year-olds, uh, sprint racing, uh, where the horses get out and run as fast as they can, and they're pretty predictable. And where, where the betting, when the win betting, the win odds would be like maybe 12 to 1 bar 3, we would, we would bet the three each way. And because they didn't know uh, they didn't have a, a, a book on the place. They, they simply gave one quarter the odds for a place. Normally, I would say that's okay, but in there are instances that it's just, just not okay for them. Uh, they win odds would be so high, uh, on these horses because, you know, Usually the, the favorite was odds on. So then the second and third favorites would be way out there. So one quarter of the odds of those win prices was a very good deal. So I did this with, with this guy for a few years. And, uh, they did, they didn't know about the mathematics, but I looked at the mathematics and I could see what it was. They thought they were getting tips of a bookmaker. But it wasn't a bookmaker. It was just a shrewd debtor. And uh, so I started doing it by myself. And uh, from there it went, uh, like like most things in gambling, 
what was a good thing petered out uh, because of a uh, change in odds. They, they were only given 150 odds. Uh, there was a tax as well, government tax. Uh, so the horses became unprofitable. And I began to look at other things. Uh, at the time, this now we're talking about we're talking about the 60s, 60s, 60s and 70s. Yes, and uh, I didn't go straight into blackjack. I I, I went into uh, uh, banking uh, games, designing games for uh, members only clubs, not really casinos, but they were. There was gambling in them. And so I, I did that for, uh, three or four years. Until then again, the, uh, it dried up because of the government, uh, uh, legalizing gambling. And we're talking now, a long time ago, you know, 1965, 66. And so I was looking for a game which would be legal and that I could bank on tables. And I came up with a, uh, a game which uh, was similar to blackjack, uh, where the dealer actually uh, played as a, in parallel with, with, the, uh, with the player against the dummy hand. And uh, I taught the dealer how to count cards. So the dealer had basic strategy and counting cards against punters, against your average punter. So it was giving us about you know two percent advantage or something like that. Uh, this carried on for a very short while because so- the. Uh, Don, yeah, sorry, let, me, yeah. let me stop you for a second. So um, this is the 60s. How did you know about counting cards? Had you read Thorpe's book at this point? Uh, no. Uh, there there was... Uh, I don't know who he was. He was a dentist, uh, a character I've never run across him. But one of my dealers told me that he was going and playing blackjack and counting cards. And so I, I looked into it and uh, did some work on it myself, uh, worked out the basic strategy uh, pretty well myself, and uh, a very basic card counting. Actually, the, the card, the, the system that I used Ended up, uh, I think it's called the Silver Fox now. It was, uh, Ace, Ace 10, 9 against 2 to 7. Um, which was okay. And, uh, it was easy for the dealer to do that. But that, that's how I, uh, mm. that's how I managed it. So when did you switch from running games to being a player? When the authorities here in England, they shut down every avenue for me for banking games. So then I decided I'd I'd done this work on the blackjack. And I thought, well, I'm going to uh, look at this more carefully and uh, get out there and try it. And that's what I did. I I made a trip along across uh, North Africa, camping trip with my children, uh, with a hand calculator and uh, lots of the graph paper and so on. And uh, I came up with something which was pretty reasonable. Uh, and on the way back, through Europe to England, uh, we were in a camper van, and uh, we stopped off in uh, Germany. Uh, the mother of my children at that time was uh, 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 
a German, originally, originally a German. And she wanted to see her mother, who is in Freiburg in southern Germany, which is just south of Baden-Baden. And of course, everyone's heard about Baden-Baden. So I jumped in the car with her and I drove up to Baden-Baden, which is like, I don't know, have you been there? It's like, yeah. it's a Baroque, Baroque palace, really. It's, it's something else. And I saw a game there, which was quite incredible. Uh, there was, uh, there were only three players playing, uh, professionally. Uh, uh, he was a, an old school player. Uh, you may not have ever heard of him. Uh, George Borden and his, and his, uh, girlfriend who he married, uh, who is a, uh, former Miss Finland and, uh, a little, uh, German, uh, psychology professor called Rudy. And there were just the three of them there and they were bouncing between, you know, minimum and maximum. This, of course, is the big advantage of European casinos. Uh, not so much now, but it used to be. You could just go in and bounce from minimum to maximum with a bit of an act and you could get away with just about anything. Well, the game was so good. Uh, when I got, I, I, I looked at it, I went back to London, I looked it up. Uh, this is when I first got a hold of a book, uh, Stanford Wong's book. And, uh, I could see that one of the rules, which is, you know, what they call a five card Charlie now, uh, it was an automatic winner. Which wow. is like one one and a half percent on so that one if, thing. If 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 Wong had a book out, this had to be the seventies by now, the mid seventies or something. Yeah, yeah, we're talking seventies now. Yep. Okay, so so you didn't really get started kind of playing professionally then until about the seventies. Until the seventies. Okay. The 70s. Okay. So yeah, you find a uh, five card uh, automatic yeah, the five, win. That's, the five card trick was yeah was really really something. Uh, so I uh, had uh, a nice time playing Baden-Baden. Uh, they eventually, they changed. They realized what, what was happening and they changed. Uh, but I, I persevered playing in, uh, in England. England was just four decks at the time. The rules weren't so good. Uh, but I, I was playing Europe Europe and England, uh, counting. Uh, the other thing, yes, I, I've forgotten about that. Uh, in Baden-Baden, uh, when they, when they start, when they stopped the five card, uh, George Borden got very upset and he went back to Vegas. Uh, Rudy, uh, was still playing. So I had a word with him and he said, don't worry about it. He said, there's something here that is just as good, if not better. And uh, I said, what is it? He said, I'm not going to tell you, but you look, look at the shuffle. And that's when I started looking at shuffles and the shuffle was so easy to shuffle track. They, they simply, they piled the decks up. In a, in a, in one pile. And then they didn't split it at all. They just took a couple of clumps from the top, shuffled it, put it down, a couple of clumps from the middle, shuffled it, put it down, and so on, and put it back. So it was, uh, it was a shuffle, shuffle tracker's dream, really. When I, that's when I, that's when I first. Uh, yeah, when I started playing, we, we, called that the the Berlin shuffle because they shuffled that way in Berlin. It was unbelievable to because the cards didn't get mixed with anything. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And there was a place in Vegas that shuffled that way. There was a, a casino called the Westward Ho that was next to Circus Circus that had a six deck game where they did that same thing. In so, those days? In uh, those days. Yeah, that would have been oh the like around nineteen eighty uh, the early eighties. Yes. Well, it's, it's always amazed me, 
Uh, I mean, I can give you an example of, you know, uh, sequencing, ace tracking. Uh, I had a team of two or three people in uh, Vegas. Uh, this was about uh, mm, 15 years ago. Oh. So it's fairly recent. And uh, I had to leave to go up to Alberta to uh, visit with my wife for a couple of weeks. And uh, while I was there, I got a call from two of these people. And they said, uh, uh, Chucky baby, you should get down here because there's a, there's a, a shuffle and we're not sure whether it's, it's, uh, ace trackable or not. So I said, okay, I'll come by as quickly as I can. And I got there and <laughs> when they brought me around, it was in Sam's town. You know, Sam's town. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They brought me around to Sam's town and they had this shuffle machine. <laughs> I couldn't believe what I saw. Pro shuffle. And this this, yeah. this shuffle machine simply split split the six decks or eight decks or whatever it was into two, and then the machine just pushed them together, and that was it. One time, yeah, one yeah, single. Yeah, just pushing them together, you know. Yeah, so the it, problem was that they just would not take any action at all in Samstown. We also tried to play that and just, you know, as soon as you bet a black chip, they were freaking out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we, we had a good act. We had a, uh, a young, a young girl and, uh, uh, she was Chinese and the guy was, uh, uh, Indian, uh, from India. And, uh, so they, they weren't taken seriously, let's put it that way. So they got like about a week's play. Wow. Going, going from minimum to max, I think it was a thousand. Yeah, maximum, a thousand limit. Yeah. It was five, five dollars to a thousand or something. <laughs> <laughs> and they were picking up like double aces, like double lock jacks. Yeah, the um, but you know, for a place like Simonstown, you wouldn't expect that to happen. They're pretty shrewd, you know. Yeah, the there was also a casino out on the east side of town. Now it's the Fiesta, but it was called the Ram, not the Rampart. The uh, what was that called uh, before it was the Fiesta? Bob it started with an R. Yeah, um, it had a a plane. A yeah. crashed airplane in the middle of the casino. Yeah, but they had that machine too, and um, they took some action, um, at least for a while, until everybody that oh, knew how so to. Oh, so you've seen ace- the machine? <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I played a lot I, against I that machine. I doubt it was Shuffle Master. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, so there's been a lot of uh, over the evolution of uh, blackjack. There's been a lot of. Uh, Funny things happening. So things that you wouldn't expect. How did you first start? Uh, so you you started uh, shuffle tracking there in Baden Baden, and then how did you then make the jump into ace location? Well, uh, like I said, I I first came across the aces um, in Holland. There were a couple of guys sitting in the first and second box, and they were writing down something and they were catching aces and uh i knew they weren't counting because they kept asking me when to take insurance <laughs> so i spoke to them at, at the end of the session and they they showed me on a piece of paper and i said are you allowed to do this he said yeah they don't mind i thought well it's only holland that's going to allow somebody to piece of paper and pencil at a blackjack table. They changed their mind after a while, by the, by the way, in Holland, yeah. But anyway, when I got back to England, I, I, I didn't think too much about, uh, about ace, about aces or tired tracking until I met this guy from Leicester and, uh, I met her in Scotland and, uh, he was doing it. He was without, without a piece of paper. And so I had lunch with him and, uh, 
he told me exactly uh, that he, you know, he was doing it. He was memorizing the key cards. So I put my thinking cap on and came up with uh, uh, my first attempt at a good memory system because this is the key. You need a good memory system because it's uh, you, you've got to be able to memorize lots of key cards and be able to retrieve them at the speed of blackjack. Uh, the memorizing is easier than the retrieving, I can tell you. Uh, yes, I've, you I've, try, played yeah. I've played a lot of this too. I've played a lot of this too, and I, I agree with you. It's, uh, um, the retrieving is, is more difficult. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then of course, once I, once I did that, I, I, I trained up some people and I, I, I came to the States and, uh, at that time in the States, it was relatively unknown, certainly by the casinos and also, I think, by the players, you know. Uh, so we had a nice uh, free, uh, maybe a year of uh, uh, freedom with uh, where they didn't really understand what we were doing or they thought what we were doing was uh, not possible and uh, not profitable and uh but of course then they changed then they started changing their shovels you know um the, uh, it just occurred to me um there was a team from the UK uh that had a bust at the dunes um where the dunes arrested them was that were you part of that group uh no they were they were they were people that I had trained, and they were out on their own. Okay. I think I know. I think I know who you mean. Uh, yeah. They. Uh, yeah. Well, what happened was they. They were. Uh, they were getting introduced by a casino host. Into other casinos, in order to play. So uh, it, it was. Uh, it was straightforward. They were just ace tracking, but they were. You know, getting a little bit of help. Yeah, uh, one of the um, one of the <laughs> one of the guys was uh, carrying a cane, and yeah. they were convinced yeah. that there was a computer hidden in the cane. Right. And so when they, uh, you know, when it, it all they went took away, him, they it, took them in. They broke the chain over their knee. The cops. Yep. Right. Yep. I know this story. He told me. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a guy that I train, and he's he's quite a good uh, uh, sequencer. Hmm. Um, yeah, he he was given a rough time actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah he yeah. said that uh, he said he called for the police, and the uh, the Vegas police arrived. And when they when they arrived, he said I felt much uh, more comfortable. But then one of them. I don't know whether it was a cop or the or gaming uh, uh, the gaming people in the casino. One of them took his his cane and broke it over his knee. <laughs> and he said, then he was wondering where he was going to end up in the desert. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so we're going to take a brief commercial break, and then we'll be back with Chucky Baby and a lot more adventures of blackjack in the good old days. South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In May, the promotion is half-price gas and goods promotion. Earn and redeem $25 worth of points, which is earned by playing $8,334 coin in, and you receive a $50 gift card for Walmart or Chevron. Limit 10 cards per month in any combination. Assuming you value the gift cards the same as cash, this means South Point is offering a 0.6% slot club for your first $83,000 coin in. On Monday, May 31st, Memorial Day, there will be a $32,000 hot seat giveaway. 
where every three minutes between 8 a.m. and midnight, some player receives $100 in free play. Mondays are senior days for those of us at least 50 years of age and older. Using your points, you get half-price dining, half-price bingo, and $4 movies. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is Wheel Poker Deluxe. This is a game where you pay an extra five coins per game, meaning triple play costs 20 coins, five play costs 30 coins, and 10 play costs uh, 55 coins. And the bonuses come on Delp trips, full houses, and quads. Slightly different for Deuces Wild variation. If you get one of the bonuses, you spin the wheel. When the wheel spins, it lands on a drawing opportunity. Sometimes it is 100 play, 4 to a flush. Sometimes it is 10 play with a pair of aces. Sometimes it is triple play, 4 to a royal, etc. There is no skill involved in the hold for the bonus, and the bonus is earned on the draw, meaning that if you know the strategy to the base game, you know the strategy for the Wheel Poker Deluxe version. It adds a bit of EV with quite a bit of variance. Surprisingly, the triple play version always pays a bit more than the five play version. For example, in 9-6 double, 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 the double, double bonus, the base game pays 98.98%. The five play version of Wheel Poker Deluxe pays 99.31%. And the triple play version pays 99.47%. All right, we're talking with Chucky Baby. Uh, let me slip in a, an offbeat question that I want to make sure we get time to answer. You are writing a book now. What is that book about? Okay, the book is, a, like I say, it's a, a bit of a pot boiler. Uh, uh, the title is uh, Charles Charles, the BJ Guru and his BJ angels uh it has not been published yet um it's a story of uh four eager beaver uh young women learning blackjack and traveling uh across the globe playing in exotic places and having lots of fun at the end an appendix there will be some serious stuff. It'll either be, uh, depending on the publisher, it'll be either at the end of the book or it'll be in, uh, perhaps, uh, online on, on a website. And in the appendix, uh, I will be, uh, outlining all of the, the advanced plays in blackjack, uh, box playing, uh, shovel tracking, ace tracking, uh, CSM play, uh, things like that. So well, that'll, the, the that'll make is, a lot of players happy. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, you know how people are. They, they, they don't like it when, you know, you reveal too much. So I, I'm sure you'll get some blowback on that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> So very good. Yeah. When that yeah. comes out, please let us know, and we'll make sure to get the word out for you. I'll do that. Thank you, Bob. So I want to. I have to ask uh, a question. Um, so when when back in about 1980, I met a legendary player, a guy named John Kretz, and he was a legend because in 1980 he had already won a million dollars playing blackjack, and he went and had plastic surgery to change his face so that he could keep playing. And uh, I want to ask you the same question I asked him. Uh, I asked him, you know, you've all, a million dollars was a lot of money in 1980. And so I asked him, why the hell are you still playing? <laughs> and now I have to ask you, you're 90 years old, and you're about to partake on a world trip to go play. Why are you still playing? 
Okay. Well, I, I can tell you this, that if I lived in Vegas, I wouldn't play. The reason I'm playing is because I love traveling. I think that's why I originally took up blackjack, is because I could see that it was a, a nice way to get around and see the world. And you have been literally everywhere, right? Um, I mean, we already heard about Africa, not the playing in Africa, but you've been basically everywhere? Oh, yeah, I've been. Uh, I know that uh, Vagabond uh, said something about uh, 140 countries he's visited or something like that. I should think I, I'm about the same. <laughs> I've probably visited most of the same casinos that he did, probably. I don't know. I don't know Vagabond other than through, uh, I've had uh, conversations uh, with him uh, on Discord. The so Discord. You're on uh, on Rymo's Discord? Well, it must be if you had conversations with Vagabond. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, I said that's Rymo's Discord, the Blackjack Discord um, that Rymo no, no, runs. Not the, not the big one, the private one. There's a, there's a private Discord. There's only like nine or ten people on it. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I didn't yeah, get invited good, to that one. Nine or ten good people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're, you are active. <clears throat> you found it um, beneficial to be on Blackjack forums and on the Discord, obviously. Well, like I say, I've, I've only done this... Uh, over the past two or three, two or three years. Uh, prior to that, I never bothered. But, uh, over the past two or three years, uh, partly because of COVID and so on, but I, I was reaching out, uh, not for information, uh, but to, uh, to try to, uh, to reach, uh, like-minded people who wanted to play blackjack and travel and that perhaps I would bankroll them or we'd, we'd bankroll, you know, 50, 50 or whatever, you know, but it was for that reason. That was the reason. So uh, can you talk about where you're going on your next trip or it's uh, the secret game? Uh, well, I can tell you vaguely, I can tell you vaguely, uh, it'll be, uh, Europe, uh, uh in, including, uh, Eastern Europe, um, uh, North Africa. If you can't say too much, probably, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to be, uh, yeah, no, diplomatic I, about this. That's fine. But, uh, there's a lot of, like, strange little places like islands and so on, you know, mm. uh, that I'll be, that I'll be visiting, you know. I mean, I can tell you about one island, which I won't visit again, which is Christmas Island. Uh, Christmas Island is, uh, belongs to Australia. And, uh, I played there some, some years ago and, uh, they, they were very, very, uh, unpleasant. It was a good game, but it was very unpleasant. They, uh, they stopped me as I was trying to leave the island, uh, went through all of my, uh, all of my, uh, my money. Uh, uh, this isn't the casino. This is the, they were working together with the immigration. And, uh, all in all, it was, it was an unpleasant, Circumstance. It's a lovely little island, by the way, Christmas Island. Very nice. Are there but, are there places you went where you did not feel safe? Where I didn't feel safe? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, Bulgaria. Uh, I was mugged in Bulgaria. Uh, quite badly, you know, put into the hospital. Wow. Uh, in Sofia. 
some of the other places that you would imagine would be rough were not. You know. But uh yeah, there was Bulgaria was, was bad. Uh did you play uh Can't. Moscow? No. No. I I've never played uh well, I've played a couple of nights uh in Saint Petersburg many years ago. Uh I took a boat from Finland. I was playing in Finland and I uh, took a boat with uh with a Dutch guy that I was playing with. And we went to St. Petersburg, uh, not to play, mostly just to see. And we found out that there was a, a strange casino run by some sort of gangster. <laughs> and uh, so we played there, but uh, not nothing, you know, nothing untoward happened. <laughs> but uh, it was a bit of an experience. But, uh, it sounds like you've trained a lot of people and had a lot of teammates. Is that because you uh, just prefer um, playing sort of with others, or? or... Yes, yes. Uh, I I don't know if you you know the the book by Alan Silito, the loneliness of the long distance runner. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think a blackjack player playing alone hits that. You know, it's it's a lonely thing playing solo. Uh, very stressful and very lonely, and so it's nice to have a, a some company with you. And uh, I, in the beginning, I it was it was a guy. You know, I I'd have a guy travel with me, but that didn't do, go so well with the casinos because when they saw two guys. They were just like twice as attentive as they should be to what we were doing. So I ended up, uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, my wife, uh, some of her friends, uh, agreed to, to travel and play with me. And, uh, when we went through all the friends, then I advertised for, for some, uh, female traveling Blackjack traveling companions and so on. Now so that's got to be was, that's got to be weird. Like your wife was like, "Fine, go with my friend on a on a trip." And I mean, I don't know. I I just would think that would be a, a not a very smooth conversation. But your <laughs> wife was fine with that. No, it did. It didn't. Uh, it it uh, it worked there. Okay, there was no problems. And and advertising for that, I mean, I'm I would think women would think this would be very weird. Yes, yes, I had to. I had some very very strange people uh, answering the ads. Uh, uh, I remember one of them was a uh, was a uh, a professional witch, <laughs> and, she, and she decided that she wanted to. Uh, Use her occult powers to help me <laughs> with the blackjack. Uh, so yes, uh, but in, in general, uh, uh, quite often, uh, one, I would have one, one, uh, assistant and for some reason or other, she would want to stop playing after a couple of years. She wanted to do something else. She would find one of her friends. You know, that often happened as well. But in general, yes, and and then uh, uh, then I started actually making teams. Uh, uh, when I was in Macau, that was in '82. In Macau, uh, that was probably the biggest win that I've ever had, and I think it's the biggest win that a lot of the players ever had. The game was incredible. It was. Uh, Five card, half, 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 uh, five card. And, uh, the, the nicest thing in those days was, uh, there were about 35 tables, uh, and it was a wonging game. And you could wong in, and as long as your bet, your wonging bet 
was bigger than the person that you were betting with, you had to call. So you could stand there and just bet over these these uh, small small time Chinese betters and have the whole have the whole table. You could bet the whole table and call all of the hands yourself. This was a big big advantage. Yeah, five card half win, and and they had and a half win too, right? And the half win, yeah, yeah. Of course, you know. Stunt for a while himself was there uh, for a couple of weeks, and uh, the big, the big, uh, the big win and the big uh, uh, hullabaloo was was the uh, the Czech team, the, the magnificent seven they called themselves. Yep, yep. Or I don't know if they call themselves that, but that's what they ended up being named as. They're the ones who made the. Uh, Headlines on the Wall Street Journal. Magnificent Seven breaks the bank in Macau or something to that effect. Did Stanley Ho and the other owners in Macau put up with your big wins gracefully? They couldn't do otherwise because it was under Portugal at the time. And Portugal wouldn't allow them to ban anyone. No, but they were gangsters and people, you know, he was known for blowing up people's cars and things. So uh. <laughs> there were triads. Yeah, I, I had some problems with the triads. But. Uh, well, what was that like? Uh, I mean, <laughs> you, yeah, uh, well, essentially, uh, actually, it was, you know, Jelko was there with his team. Uh-huh. And uh, one of his team, silly young guy, uh, he was he had made uh, some kind of a romantic liaison with uh, one of the massage girls, these Thai massage girls. And the massage girl that he picked happened to be the girlfriend of one of these triad people. So they came on strong to him. And. I don't know why, but he told them that I, you know, at the time I was about 50, and these guys, they were all in their early 20s. He said, that old guy there, he's the one that's making all the money. So go to him. We aren't making any money. So the triads came to me and uh, started hassling me on the table. And I had... uh, I had become friendly with a couple of the the uh, security people that were supposedly uh, monitoring my play. Uh, one of them uh, we dubbed uh, 007. And uh, I asked them what to do about these triads. The, the triads were uh, hustling me in the table, uh, not letting me get to my bets on the table. So they said, well, go and speak to the manager. So I spoke to the manager, who was the brother of Stanley Ho, John Ho, very nice guy. And he called these these hoodlums into his office, and he said, what's going on? And they said, oh, you know, they're talking tough, you know, Macau belongs to us, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, no, it doesn't belong to you. So he called his security, and he threw them out. <laughs> but when I tried to leave the casino, they were waiting for me outside, of course. So I had to go back in and uh, uh, get get a little bit more help. Let's put it that way from uh, from John Ho, from the manager. But uh, yes, there were triad uh, problems, and th- the rumor is that the Czech team—that's the reason that they left—that uh, they were being uh, harassed, to put it mildly. And they got uh, a little bit worried about it, so they decided to leave. They had made lots of money. They were there before me, and uh, so they had they had cleaned up. You know, I think the Wall Street uh, Journal was quite right saying that they pretty well broke broke the bank. Uh, apparently, they they kept all their chips. They didn't cash them in, 
And uh, it's a big casino. That was the Lisboa Casino. It's a big casino, big action, so there's a lot of chips. And at the end of their stay, I don't know how long they stayed, maybe a couple of weeks, they had uh, this big bag full of chips, which they took to the casino and dumped, dumped onto to count them. <laughs> It took them about 10 minutes to count the chips, I think. So they did well. By the time I got to Macau, uh, it was what I considered to be the worst game in the world. Um, they had taken away the five-card half win and the early surrender. Uh, they would uh, burn a card after every hand. Uh, they would hide yeah, the discards. That, they were doing that at, at the time as well when I was there. Yeah. They would uh, they did, the they did, yeah, they did burn every, so you, yeah, you couldn't sit down on an empty table because you got too many burned cards. And the but worst we thing was, it, it, hmm. it, it was the slowest game I have ever seen in my life. Um, very slow, very seven slow. Seven spots with multiple bets on all the spots. And literally, when the dealer was done with the shoe, she would pull up a stool and sit down and smoke a cigarette. Before exactly shuffling. right. Exactly was, right. Yeah, I I just was mind boggled when I saw. Uh, oh, and they well, would also steal your money. They um, if you got a blackjack, before the, yeah, they yeah. would take Bef- the extra half your bet as a tip, right. and you would have to yes, argue yes. and get it back. Oh yes, I I almost got into a lot of trouble over that. Uh, it's a it's an interesting story. Uh, I I was you know all hair and everything when I was there, you know all over me. I looked a bit like John Lennon. And one of the dealers decided to call me John Lennon. And she kind of, I got along well with her, you know, so I used to call her Yoko, Yoko Ono and John Lennon. And uh, I, of course, never tipped. Uh, they would try to keep the, keep the, the 10% 50%. before they gave you a payout, like you say. Uh, and they knew me, so but this one day, Yoko, just to, to tease, she kept she kept the ten percent. She said, "John, I'm not going to give it to you, John." And I said, "Yoko, you must give it to me." So everyone's laughing, you know, on the tables. Everybody's having a joke about this, you know. But then they started to get angry because the game was so slow. So all the punters started, you know, "Come on, get on with the game." So I said, "Yoko." If you don't give me, I'm going to take it from the chip tray. So she said, oh, take it from the chip tray. So I reached over, took it from the chip tray, and all hell broke loose. The table was surrounded by by security people. I was lifted off my feet into John Hole, the manager's office. And John Hole looked at me and said, what have you been doing? <laughs> he said, I've seen it on, on the screen. He said, I know that you're just messing about. But he said, if you do this again, you are going to be barred. You have to be barred. I have to bar you. I said, oh, my God. So I got away with it. But, uh, yeah, they used to do that, keep the 10% tip. With me, it standard was, procedure. With me, it was 50%. So if you had a, a hundred dollar blackjack, they would take the extra fifty dollars. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, they oh. didn't because I argued, and of course they, you know, no longer could speak English when I wanted the money back, and then I would have to call the boss over. I mean, I didn't play long because the game was so bad already. Um, but uh, yeah, I had to call the boss over, and the boss had to force the dealer to give me the money back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you you missed out the best part of Macau from the sound of it. Oh yeah, I I got there too late for for that one. You were just a little bit too late. Mm-hmm. Well, since Richard got there too late for the Macau party, we're now going to switch to our recommended section, where Richard and I, and sometimes our guests, tell our audience about something we have seen recently so richard do you have a recommended for our desks um yeah i'm watching uh hbo has been making these limited series and um i'm watching one right now that i'm really enjoying called mayor of east town 
um, which stars Kate Winslet. Um, they get, you know, big actors for these things. Uh, Kate, like Kate Detective. Winslet. The what? Oh, uh, interesting. Let me tell you, uh, can I tell you a short story about Kate Winslet? Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, can I do that, Bob? Yeah. Uh, of course. I and my wife uh, support uh, a charity over here for homeless people. It's called uh, Cardboard Citizens. And Kate Winslet is a patron of, of this. And uh, we had a, a dinner uh, where I met Kate, Win- Kate Winslet, and she was auctioning off. Uh, it was a fundraising dinner and in the big hotel here in London. She was auctioning off uh, her clothes from the Titanic and so on and so forth. Uh, and... I was auctioning blackjack lessons. <laughs> so I gave some poor, some poor soul, but it was charity. Uh, they paid 1500 pounds for a five lesson one on one blackjack course. <laughs> that was through uh, Kate Winslet. Mm. Uh-huh. All right, so Richard, you were telling us about an HBO special. Yeah, well, no, that was it. It's called Mayor of East Town. Uh, it's I, I, it's good. I recommend it. Right. All right. My recommendation is a book. It's called The Greatest Gambling Stories Ever Told, which is a, a very interesting group of stories. It includes excerpts from books we've all heard, like um, Walter Tevis and the Hustler and Fyodor Dostoevsky called The Gambler and other ones from authors you've probably heard of but didn't know they wrote gambling such as D.H. Lawrence and Mario Puzo and then there's some uh, classics one of my favorites was from, by Damon Runyon who was a very colorful writer and um, wrote the story behind Guys and Dolls. So I enjoyed it very much and recommend it. Yeah, Damon Runyon's great. Actually, I would recommend that. Is Damon Runyon, uh, you can get collections of his short stories. They're fantastic. They're great, yeah. yeah. Well, one of my favorite authors... American authors is uh, Don DeLillo. And uh, he reminds me of, uh, because he talks, he, you know, he writes about New York and so on. So he reminds me a little bit of Damon Runyon, a kind of sophisticated Damon Runyon. Yeah, I actually, one of the stories in the book is called, there, there's a story goes with it. Which, uh, as as a storyteller, I especially enjoyed. And then I found on YouTube there was a Damon Runyon theater, which was came out in the 40s, I guess. And they did the same story, except they made so many changes to it that I was really disappointed. the um, The short story itself was quite a bit better than the than the theater. You mean they did it? They turned it into yeah. a play. Is yeah. that what you mean? Yeah, they turned it into a half-hour play, and they had a series of those. And overall, um, if I had not heard the original first or read the original first, I think I would have enjoyed the play a lot. But since I hadn't done the original, I didn't really like the enhancements to it. Right. All right. We've well, been talking. Well, these days. Do you have an uh, additional? Yeah, these days uh, I'm passing my time. Uh, watching a television uh, series, you know, uh-huh. uh, and the, the the current one that I'm enjoying very much is Killing the Killing. Uh, I'm very much into uh, Scandi noir stuff, and uh, apparently the, the Killing was uh, it was uh, it was it was sent to to the states as well, I think. Uh, is a thir- thirteen. We have 13, it on Netflix, uh, I believe. I 13, believe yeah. I've watched it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the one that they're doing here for England is a bit longer. It's twenty, 
20 sessions, but uh, very, very intriguing, well thought out uh, mystery. Uh, and the, you know, the cinematography of it is incredible. Yeah. Very good. Um, we're going to have to leave now. We thank you very much, Chucky Baby, for sharing some of your adventures with us. Uh, it was quite interesting, and uh, the world has changed a bit since you started. It's been a big change. <laughs> yes, it's a big, 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 big change. But uh, it's all all about technology now, isn't it? Right. Well, I'm actually impressed that someone 90 years old is on Discord. The um, there's staying up technologically after you get to a certain age is not that common, and I commend you for that. Thank you, and you're doing pretty well yourself. Yeah, I'm still a kid of 74 though, so I. Uh... But Bob knows everything about how to use his flip phone. I wish. <laughs> the flip phone, yes. <laughs> Clamshell type. All right, so thank you, Chucky Baby. Uh, thank okay, you it's been nice talking to both of you. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day.